thanks for everyone uh, showing up uh, this evening. Um, we have a big crowd tonight, a uh, good number of people here. So um, put your questions in the Q&A and we'd love to hear from you there. I uh, want to also, of course, welcome uh, Dr. Timothy Shannon from Gettysburg College uh, for being here. A good evening to you, Tim. Glad to have you. Glad to be here, John. Thanks for having me. Good. Well, um, uh, folks in the audience, uh, you can see the uh, title of the presentation. Uh, but before we start that, uh, let me just introduce you a little bit more to uh, Timothy Shannon. He uh, received a uh, BA in uh, from Brown University and a PhD, I assume, in history from Northwestern University. Uh, he teaches early American history, Native American history, and British history at Gettysburg College. Uh, his most recent book is Indian Captive, Indian King, Peter Williamson in America and Britain, which came out uh, three years ago. And that was awarded the 2019 Frank Watson Book Prize for Best Book in Scottish History. He is also the author of Iroquois Diplomacy on the Early American Frontier that came out in 2008 and Indians and Colonists at the Crossroads of Empire, the Albany Congress of 1754 in 2000. And that book uh, won the Dixon Ryan Fox Prize from the New York State Historical Association and the Distinguished Book Award from the Society of Colonial Wars. So again, thanks for joining us, Tim. We really appreciate it. It's a great way to kick things off in the beginning of our week-long uh, Colonial Conflict Symposium. Uh, before we start, um, uh, I wanted to ask you how you came to focus on this pre-Revolutionary War era um, in the 1750s through early 1770s uh, in your career. I, uh, I got very interested in this uh, period, really, as a child uh, growing up in, in Connecticut and New England. You know, I was always impressed by the gravestones at the, in the churchyard that I walked by when I, when I went through town and all that. And uh, really, it was in college that I started studying history in earnest. And I was able to take a couple of courses with Gordon Wood, who is long since retired, but still alive today and still a very productive scholar of revolutionary America. And I think it was that work that made me think that this would be something worth pursuing as a career. So uh, I, I, I then uh, went off and pursued a graduate degree uh, at Northwestern, as you noted, and I've been teaching at Gettysburg now for uh, 25 years, so it, it's been a very, very nice career. Let me turn over the uh, narrative to you uh, so you can go along with your slides here, and uh, we'll get to questions after you've concluded, and uh, looking forward to hearing this. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much, John. Uh, thank you, Liz, for uh, uh, for the work you're doing here tonight. And thank you to everyone for coming. I'm sorry that we can't be doing this in person, but uh, the pandemic's been going on for a while. And so I've done a number of these talks uh, in Zoom format. And uh, I think it's a testament to everyone's ability to adapt uh, that, that we've been able to continue with, uh, with programming like this. So as John indicated, what I, I want to talk to you about tonight is uh, the French and Indian War, but really one particular aspect of the French and Indian War, which is the clash of European and colonial and Native American military cultures uh, in this conflict. And the way I want to illustrate that for you is by focusing on two events, one of which uh, you, you probably are already familiar with if you've read Last Mohicans or perhaps you've seen one of the film adaptations of that novel, and that's the massacre at Fort William Henry. And then the other event, one that's perhaps less familiar to you, is the massacre at Oswego, which had occurred a year before uh, the incident at Fort William Henry. Both of these events um, kind of illustrate this clash of Native American and European military cultures. Um, the massacre at Fort William Henry, like I said, is uh, probably familiar to you if you've read uh, James Fenimore Cooper's Last of the Mohicans, which was published in 1826 and is still read today, or even more likely if you watched um, one of the film versions, there's a famous version of it from the 1930s, but of course it was remade in the 1990s with Daniel Day-Lewis, and uh, it's really a, a very effective film. Uh, and 
this, uh, this, this uh, conflict at Fort William Henry in which a, uh, a French force with a sizable number of Indian allies uh, was able to, to take a, a British post and then the native allies of the French attacked the British after the fort had surrendered uh, has often been used as kind of a, um, a thumbnail, if you will, to, to illustrate what happened during the French and Indian War. The, um, the colonial soldiers are presented as these kind of hardy frontiersmen. James Fenimore Cooper's hero was Natty Bumpo, who's you know, a, a colonial uh, uh, male who's grown up among Indians, has become a great hunter and fighter as well. Uh, the hubris of the British officers uh, who really uh, don't know how to adapt their command, how to adapt their strategy, their tactics to the American wilderness. The treachery of the French, the Marquis de Montcalm, the uh, commander of the French force who, you know, uh, 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 seems to have these aristocratic values of fair play and so forth, but then enlists his Indian allies, these savage Indian allies who do not observe the rules of war and attack uh, this innocent column of soldiers and civilians after it has surrendered. Uh, the less famous example of this is what happened at Fort Oswego on Lake Ontario in New York, almost exactly a year before what happened at Fort William Henry in 1757. It's really just a smaller scale version. Uh, provincial soldiers, American soldiers at this post of Oswego on Lake Ontario surrendered to a French and Indian force. Again, uh, commanded by the Marquis de Montcalm, and the Indian allies of the French overran the garrison after it had surrendered and uh, killed several of, uh, more than several of the uh, American soldiers and civilians uh, who were stationed there. Uh, and so these incidents have come to shape our perception of warfare in colonial America. It's a particularly brutal kind of frontier warfare. Uh, in which Native Americans play a very important role, in which European uh, officers and soldiers who uh, come over uh, to conduct these wars are kind of at a loss for uh, their ability to adapt to the American environment, and in which American soldiers uh, and militiamen kind of cut their teeth, uh, people like George Washington, for example, uh, gaining the military experience that they will need uh, to win American independence. So my purpose is to re-examine both of these massacres today and see what they can tell us about the Native American way of war and how that clashed with the European way of war. And so let's start off by talking a little more specifically about Native American warfare during the colonial era. And uh, when anthropologists and historians talk about Native American warfare, they often use this term, the morning war complex. And, and, and that is used uh, as a way of explaining Native American methods of war and objectives in war. Uh, and, and, and the important thing to remember here is that when Native Americans went to war, they did so uh, to pursue people uh, rather than to conquer new territory. Young men would set out to prove themselves uh, by fighting traditional enemies, uh, and by taking captives. And you see an image here, this is actually from a, a French record in the 17th century, showing two Iroquois warriors marching back to their village, having taken uh, an enemy captive. And when those captives were returned to the village, several possible fates awaited them. They might be tortured and executed, and even in the 17th century, uh, uh, ritually cannibalized. Uh, they might be enslaved and traded to allies. They might be adopted as kinfolk, uh, adopted into Indian families and into Indian communities and, uh, and, and raised as brothers and sisters and as husbands and wives. Uh, if Indian warriors were not successful in getting captives, oftentimes they resorted to taking uh, military trophies from the corpses of the enemy dead. And so the practice of scalping is, of course, uh, familiar to anyone who has studied uh, this period in early American history, but also heads, uh, the decapitated head of the enemy dead. Uh, in some cases, hands uh, could also serve the same purpose of providing proof of a warrior's success in battle, uh, but also pillaged goods and clothing, what today we might call the spoils of war, the loot of war, uh, could also be brought back as tangible evidence 
of that warrior's success in, uh, in, in, in battle. Uh, the important thing to note here, I think, in relation to um, uh, the European rules of warfare is that uh, before the arrival of Europeans in North America, Indians did not think of prisoners of war or captives is something to be returned or exchanged at the end of a conflict. You know, there in, in Europe, there is this tradition of taking prisoners of war and then exchanging them during the conflict or, or after the conflict. But among Native Americans, uh, be, to be taken captive in, in war was to have a, a permanent break from your old life. Uh, you, you know, if, if, if you survived captivity, you might live as a slave, uh, you might live as an adopted family member, or like I said, you might be ritually tortured and executed. So how did uh, the arrival of Europeans in North America affect this Native American way of war? Uh, well, some of the most obvious ways uh, I'm, I'm sure are apparent to you. Uh, the first would be the technology of warfare, the introduction of firearms by Europeans, the introduction of metal-edged weapons is going to make Native American warfare uh, much deadlier. And you can see in this image, one of the Indian warriors is walking with a flintlock uh, musket uh, over his shoulder. That's testimony to the, the impact that European firearms were going to have on Native American warfare. Uh, colonial uh, observers often referred to Native Americans as fighting in a, uh, a skulking way of war. They equated Native American warfare with uh, tactics of ambush and surprise, uh, dawn time raids on, um, on colonial, uh, isolated colonial farmsteads or frontier communities. Uh, but a lot of those tactics were an adaptation by Native Americans to this new technology of warfare to limit uh, the potential uh, fatalities that European firepower could have on Native Americans. Uh, the, the tactic of rapid retreat uh, should uh, the tide of battle uh, change uh, was something that colonial observers used to, to describe Indian warriors as, as cowardly. But in fact, as you might imagine, uh, this was a way of preserving manpower and limiting uh, casualties. Uh, another impact that Europeans have on Native American warfare is uh, alliance. Uh, certainly Native Americans are interested in recruiting Europeans as, as allies against their potential enemies. And as European uh, empires expand in North America, they rely quite heavily on Native American nations as allies against their enemies. You know, this is obviously true in, uh, in Northeastern America between French Canada and the New England colonies and uh, in New York and ultimately uh, Pennsylvania as well. Along this long contested frontier, Indian allies are going to play a pivotal role. And those Indian allies have to be won through diplomacy, through the practice of making diplomatic gifts uh, to these uh, potential allies. Uh, these Indian warriors who fight alongside European allies are not vassals of the King of England or the King of France. They are independent warriors who make their own decision as to whether or not to go to war. Uh, there is no, uh, no, no draft. There is no uh, compulsory military service uh, in Indian culture. And so uh, no matter how much power or influence the French or English or Spanish think they have, ultimately they must woo these Indian warriors into fighting uh, along with them, typically through the art of making diplomatic gifts or presents to them, large donations of material goods. Um, uh, and so even among uh, Christian Indians and uh, Indians who had been converted by Protestant or Catholic missionaries, uh, it's still uh, going to war with European allies is still a matter of individual choice. It's still a matter of personal volition. Uh, the French uh, missionaries in Canada cannot compel their converts to go to war uh, alongside French troops. And the same, of course, is true of Puritan missionaries in New England or Anglican missionaries in New York. Uh, and then the last thing I would emphasize about the impact of Europeans on Native American warfare, we, I, I've kind of already hinted at this, has to do with the, uh, European, uh, the Native American practice of captivity. Remember I said just a few minutes ago how uh, there was no tradition in Native American warfare of returning captives uh, when, a, when, when a conflict was over. 
Well, that's going to change with the advent of European and Indian warfare in North America, because Europeans are going to want to ransom European captives back at the end of a conflict. And so starting in the 17th century, and then certainly continuing through the imperial wars of the 18th century, colonial governments will pay money to have uh, captives uh, return to them at the end of one of these conflicts. And private individuals, families of captives, uh, will, uh, will raise money, raise uh, uh, the, the diplomatic presence necessary uh, in order to bargain for the return of their captives. And so in this sense, captivity in European and Indian warfare becomes commodified, if you will. Captives are commodities. Indians take captives in part because they can anticipate having a reward paid to them if they return that captive at some point in the future. And that's going to be uh, very, very important. And it certainly shapes the experience of captivity for colonial peoples in North America. If you take a look at this uh, image here, you'll see the covers of two captivity narratives uh, published during the colonial period. The one on the left is the first uh, captivity narrative published as a book in colonial New England, 1682, Mary Rowlandson's narrative of her captivity. And on the right is a later one from the mid 18th century, John Norton, another Massachusetts Indian captive from 1748. Uh, between the publication of Mary Rowlandson's narrative and John Norton's narrative, a, um, a kind of literary genre, if you will, developed in colonial New England of captivity stories, oftentimes featuring female captives like Mary Rowlandson, sometimes male captives like John Norton that you see here. Uh, and they told the story of a kind of personal physical trial of being held as an Indian captive, but also in New England, there was a heavy spiritual component to this, that captivity was a spiritual trial, a providential affliction that God was visiting upon you to kind of test your, your, your mettle as a Christian, to rededicate your life uh, to, 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 to following God. And so these, um, these captivity narratives that came out of New England had a very heavy kind of devotional spiritual uh, element to them. Uh, I, I will point out that the uh, cover of the Mary Rowlandson captivity on the left uh, is from an edition that was published in 1773, so nearly a century after the original edition. It tells you something about the popularity of this particular narrative, but the image of Mary Rowlandson holding a, 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 a musket uh, and confronting the Indians who are attacking her homestead is something that was added to this particular edition in 1773, perhaps kind of anticipating the, the militarization of New England culture uh, as they were um, uh, uh, you know, uh, gearing up for the conflict with Great Britain. Uh, the other thing I would note too about, uh, about captivity uh, in, in, in this era, uh, the, the period between Mary Rowlandson and John Norton, is that um, a, a, a practice develops in French Canada whereby um, French colonial officials, governor of Canada, uh, French priests who are, who are working as missionaries among uh, French allied Indians serve as intermediaries uh, when Indians return to Canada with Christian captives that they have taken in New England or New York, oftentimes these French uh, figures, priests, uh, private individuals, uh, military officers, uh, government officials, will intercede and purchase those captives from those Indians. And then they will put those captives to work uh, as servants so that they can, in, in essence, earn back the money that's been spent on redeeming them, and then ultimately return them to their homes in, in, in the British colonies. So there's almost, uh, if you will, an, an economy in captivity that develops in uh, colonial New France, colonial Canada, uh, that relies on this type of ransoming to take advantage of the labor of these captives until they are able to um, uh, earn back the ransom that has been paid to redeem them. There is also this kind of ethos um, among uh, European powers, the Spanish, the French, uh, the British, even though they are imperial rivals, even though uh, they embrace different religious traditions, the French and the Spanish are Catholic, the British are Protestant, that uh, Christians will help redeem fellow Christians out of Indian captivity. 
And so that becomes a part of this kind of uh, 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 economy of captivity that's developing in uh, France. Uh, there's nothing similar to this really uh, in colonial New England or colonial New York. Uh, in colonial New England, when Indians are taken captive, they are either put to the sword or they are sold into slavery or servitude. Uh, and so in some respects, we can see the treatment of, of, of captives, uh, of European captives in Canada is being much more humane than the treatment of uh, Native American captives in the British colonies. Uh, all right, let's, um, let's talk then about what happens at Oswego and at Fort William Henry during the French and Indian War. So Oswego was a fur trading post on the southeastern shore of Lake Ontario. It was established in the 1720s. It was the westernmost terminus of the British fur trade in the early 18th century. And when the French and Indian War broke out, the British decided that they wanted to fortify it and they wanted to use it as a naval base in the Great Lakes so that they could attack particularly uh, the French post at Fort Niagara. Uh, and Governor William Shirley of Massachusetts was the person who was in charge of, uh, of, of fortifying Oswego. Uh, his plans did not quite go uh, as well as he wanted them to. And in 1756, uh, a French force led by the Marquis de Montcalm, the French general who brought over about a thousand French regular troops with him to New France in 1756. He laid siege to the fort uh, with uh, a, 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 an army of French troops and about 300 uh, Indian allies who were accompanying him. The fort at Oswego was defended by provincial troops, colonial Americans who had been recruited into the British army or raised by um, uh, colonial uh, governments. Uh, they were very unseasoned, very inexperienced. And as a result, they capitulated almost immediately uh, to uh, um, the Marquis de Montcalm, who was so unimpressed by the fort's rapid surrender that he refused to grant them the honors of war. Uh, and the honors of war was a tradition in European warfare in which a victorious army would allow the defeated army to keep its arms, uh, to, uh, to, to not be looted, uh, to, to, to march out with its you know, personal security guaranteed, and then uh, to, in essence, be paroled, not be held prisoner, but be, be, be paroled from service uh, under the promise that they would not serve again in the conflict. And, and Montcalm doesn't think that this provincial army of about a thousand uh, troops deserves that kind of recognition because they have not really offered much of a defense of this post. And so he makes them all prisoners of war. And that's a very fateful decision because by making them prisoners of war, he's created the single largest group of POWs in North America up to that point. Uh, and, and he's going to have to march them back into Canada and, and, and detain them. Uh, but uh, also as a result of that decision, uh, of, of the fort's capitulation and Montcalm's decision to take uh, this small army of about a thousand troops prisoner, uh, the Native Americans who are with him are distressed. They're, they're upset by this decision. They are not party to the negotiations that lead to the fort surrender, that lead to the articles of capitulation. Uh, they have come to fight for captives and for uh, 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 war trophies. And so the Indians under Montcalm's command attack the garrison as it is surrendering. Uh, they kill the sick and the wounded in the, uh, in, in, in the military hospitals that are there. They also kill soldiers who have broken into the rum supply at the fort and have made themselves drunk. Uh, and in, in that manner have kind of lost their, their, their discipline, their ability to defend themselves. The French respond by taking the, uh, the British uh, soldiers and confining them inside a stockade and protecting them as the Indians rush that stockade and try to um, get more captives uh, and more casualties. Ultimately, things settle down uh, and order is restored, but uh, a, a number of casualties have occurred. It's very hard to determine exactly how many have been killed. Uh, the, the, uh, the commander of the British forces writes afterward that, uh, as he puts it, after the capitulation, some of them having gotten to the liquor 
as in some of his soldiers, having gotten into the liquor, fell into wrangling with the Indians, and several of them were killed, but the number is yet undetermined. Uh, two French officers who wrote reports on the engagement estimated that the number of the, um, uh, of the garrison that were killed or taken captive by the Indians was somewhere between 80 and 100. Uh, and so it's not insignificant. It represents about 10% of the garrison that was surrendered. Um, but I think it's safe to say that those that were killed uh, were killed because they were sick, wounded, or intoxicated. Uh, as these prisoners of war were marched back into Canada, there are reports, two different reports, that uh, a small number of them were taken and given over by the French to the Indians as captives, as a way of placating the Indians, uh, giving them, in essence, their, their slice of the pie. So one report uh, says that about 20 colonial soldiers were drafted out of the, 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 the garrison and handed over to the Indians. And the person who reports that doesn't witness them being executed, but imagines that they have been uh, tortured and executed. And then another witness in Montreal uh, says that 15 young men were drafted out of this force and handed over to the Indians. And he imagines that they have been taken and adopted into, um, in, into native communities. So we don't have confirmation of these two different reports, but it would seem fair uh, to indicate that perhaps 15 to 20 of these uh, soldiers were ultimately uh, uh, ended up as captives of the Indians. Uh, the fate of the rest of the Oswego uh, POWs is, is, is very, very interesting. Um, they end up confined in Quebec. Uh, and because there are no French prisoners of war in British North America at this time, in order for these prisoners of war to be exchanged, they actually have to be shipped to Europe. And so over the next year, they are put on board ships. They endure uh, difficult, as you might imagine, transatlantic passages on overcrowded ships, malnutrition, exposure to disease, and so forth. They are taken to France, and then again, over a, a year or so, they are repatriated in piecemeal fashion uh, as French and British prisoners are exchanged in Europe. So most of these Oswego prisoners of war endure a very long captivity in which they cross the Atlantic, they are exchanged and end up in England. If they are soldiers, they uh, end up drafted into other regiments in the British Army. If they are civilians, they're basically cut loose in England and they have to find their own way back to North America. And so there are actually uh, several captivity narratives that come out of this experience that tell these very circuitous routes that these uh, prisoners of war took from France to Britain, ultimately back to North America. Um, there are reports of them suffering from smallpox, from dysentery, from these other diseases that we associate with 18th century armies and confinement in prisoner of war camps. Uh, I think the bottom line is if they had simply been left uh, in, in Canada and exchanged through the traditional pattern as Indian captives, uh, they probably would have gotten home much more quickly and in much better physical health. Uh, the image I'm showing you here is of what I think is, is the most famous of these captives from Oswego, whose story I think really kind of illustrates the suffering of these prisoners. His name was Peter Williamson, and he was a soldier at Oswego, who was taken captive and ultimately uh, confined in Quebec and then uh, put on board a ship that sent him directly back to Britain. He ended up in, in southern England rather than in France, so he was kind of lucky in that regard, but he had no way of making his, his, his living. And so what he did is he started dressing up uh, in Indian costume and displaying himself in taverns and coffee houses and telling the story of his captivity. He published a narrative about his captivity in Britain and for a while became the most famous North American Indian captive in Britain. He uh, ultimately made his way back to his native Scotland, uh, settled down there and became known locally in Edinburgh as the King of the Indians. Uh, and this is a portrait of him from uh, one of the editions of his narrative in which he, he dressed up in a Native American costume. Uh, so almost a year after the Oswego massacre, the same events unfold at the Fort William Henry massacre uh, in, in almost exactly the same order 
but with larger numbers of people. Uh, this time, Montcalm is leading a much larger army, has a much larger contingent of Native American warriors with him. Uh, and the same process in which he, he lays siege to the fort, ultimately the commander of the fort, Colonel Monroe, decides to surrender it. Uh, this time, Montcalm thinks that the British have put up uh, a noble defense, and therefore he does grant the honors of war to the garrison, guaranteeing them their safety, allowing them to keep their firearms. Uh, if they evacuate to Fort Edward, uh, which is on the road south to Albany, and if they promise not to participate in the conflict uh, for 18 months, so uh, a system of parole. Uh, again, this is a, a kind of standard issue negotiation that would occur uh, uh, under the European rules of warfare for uh, a fort that's under siege and decides to surrender. Uh, it represents the kind of aristocratic military values of Montcalm on the one hand and Colonel Monroe on the other, who's a a regular British officer. But the people who are left out, of course, are Montcalm's Indian allies, some of whom have traveled from as far away as Lake Superior uh, to participate in this campaign and do not want to go home empty handed. And so as that garrison is evacuating the fort the morning after the surrender, Montcalm's Indian allies attack it. Uh, once again, they start by killing the sick and the wounded that are in the fort's uh, military hospital, and then they begin firing on the column as it's making its way along the road to Fort Edward. And this is the scene that is famously depicted in uh, Last of the Mohicans, whether it's the, the novel or, or, or the film that you are familiar with. Um, the civilians and colonial soldiers that are in the column break ranks. They, they panic and they run for the woods. Uh, this causes the column to, to, to lose its, its formation. The British regulars who are in the column do, do a little better job of kind of uh, defending themselves as, uh, as they face this attack. But what happens is um, a, a breakdown in, in discipline, certainly in, in the column. Uh, Indians take uh, approximately 600 captives. So approximately half of the garrison that has surrendered is taken captive by Indians during this attack. Montcalm and his French officers intercede as quickly as they can and start bargaining on the spot for the redemption of these captives. Uh, and they succeed in, a, in, in getting uh, control of approximately half of them. About half of the 600 that are taken by the Indians are almost immediately redeemed by Montcalm and his officers who offer up loot in exchange for them. Uh, and uh, and cajole and, and pressure and try to uh, uh, get these captives released. Uh, but one negative effect of that is that some Indian warriors, realizing they're going to be forced to surrender their captives, immediately kill them so that they can take their scalps as trophies. If they're not going to be able to take a, a living captive back, they want to at least take the scalp as a trophy uh, of, of their success in battle. Uh, the remaining half of the captives, approximately 300, are carried back into Canada by the Indians who uh, are part of this you know, successful force uh, that has is, 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 uh, laid siege to Fort William Henry. And of those 300, all but 38 of them, so slightly more than 10% of them, are redeemed within a year through that system, uh, that, that economy of captivity that I described for you earlier. Uh, through uh, ransom money that is raised by colonial governments, through the intercession of French priests and military officers who, in essence, buy these captives from their Indian allies, put them to work, and then ultimately uh, send them back home uh, to New England or New York or Pennsylvania or wherever it is that they came from. Uh, the historian who's done the most work on this, who's written the book on the Fort William Henry massacre is a fellow named Ian Steele. And he's just done marvelous work reconstructing uh, the fates of these captives. And that's his number you know, that uh, says, uh, 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 you know, 90% of those captives in Canada ultimately return. He can only, uh, he can only not account for 38 of them, uh, that you know, there's just, just no record of them after that. Uh, by his estimate, the total fatalities suffered during the um, massacre at Fort William Henry uh, he estimates to be somewhere between 69 and 184 people, soldiers and civilians. 
so, uh, you know, not a small number, certainly uh, deadlier than what happened at, um, at Fort Oswego, but neither is it, uh, you know, every person in that garrison having been massacred as a result of, uh, of what happened there. Um, so, so those are the two massacres. I, I, I hope they've, they've illustrated for you, um, uh, you know, this, this conflict between Native American and, and European warfare that I've been talking about. I'll just wrap up now by talking a little bit about what I think are the, the legacies or the, the impact of these massacres on colonial era warfare. Uh, you know, the, the, the big question is always, you know, well, why did the Indians do it? Uh, why did they um, uh, engage in these massacres? And it's pretty obvious that they did it because they weren't part of the negotiations that ended these conflicts, right? They went to war for captives, if not captives for trophies. And those were denied to them by these negotiated settlements between the European officers in charge, uh, then they were going to take those captives themselves. You know, to what degree were the French responsible for these massacres? I, you know, despite what James Fenimore Cooper would have you believe, uh, not very. Um, the, you know, the, the French officers in particular interceded uh, in both of these instances and did their best to protect the prisoners uh, that they had guaranteed uh, security to. Uh, I think it really is just a, a, a clash in military values that we're witnessing here. Um, nevertheless, the memory of these massacres does uh, animate the British war effort for the remainder of the French and Indian War. Uh, this fellow here, uh, Jeffrey Amherst, who becomes the British commander in chief towards the end of the war, refuses to extend the honors of war to the city of Montreal in 1760 when he lays siege to Montreal and, uh, and takes the last French outpost in Canada and, and completes the conquest of Canada. Uh, he, um, he fights the war in a way that uh, um, it illustrates his disdain, especially for Native Americans. Uh, Jeffrey Amherst is implicated in the Fort Pitt incident of 1763, a few years later, when a, uh, a, a plot is hatched to distribute uh, uh, blankets infected with smallpox from the hospital at Fort Pitt to the Native Americans who have laid siege to the fort. He's on record as saying things today that we would describe as being uh, very racist and almost genocidal in their intent in his, uh, in his description of Native American enemies. And so there's no doubt that these uh, massacres do um, kind of give an excuse, if you will, uh, to the British, to the colonists, to um, refuse to accord to Native American enemies and even to French enemies uh, the same protections that they would of a traditional enemy in European warfare at this time. And so in that sense, I think um, these, uh, these massacres do intensify the brutality uh, of warfare in the colonial era. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, uh, I think it's important that we pay attention to language in these incidents too. Uh, it's interesting to note that these incidents that I've just described to you come down to us in the history books as massacres, uh, but very Similar incidents in which colonial militiamen attack Native American communities and kill uh, Native American women and children as well as men uh, are often described as raids, the Catanning raid, the raid on St. Francis, a, a mission community in Canada at this time. You know, uh, those when 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 those uh, acts of brutality are conducted by colonial militiamen. Uh, they're referred to in a much more neutral term of a raid, you know, as a skirmish, a small scale conflict. But in essence, uh, when you look at them closely, you can see that oftentimes colonial soldiers have adopted the same tactics, uh, including uh, attacking civilians, including taking scalps, uh, you know, uh, mutilating the corpses of the dead uh, as a way of taking war trophies uh, that we associate with Native American warfare. Uh, so, John, I think that's a good place for me to stop. It looks like we've got about 15 minutes uh, for some today. Sure. Thank you so much for that discussion. I appreciate it, and the illustrations as well. Um, let me start out with a couple of questions of my own, if I could, Tim. Sure. Um, if, 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 it, if the um, Fort, uh, specifically about Fort William Henry on Lake George, if that wasn't the massacre that it's always been portrayed with, where did that myth or legend 
originate? Was, yeah. Um, with Cooper or was it? It, it starts it starts before James Fenimore Cooper. Um, the, the, the first use of the term massacre to describe what happened at Fort William Henry, I believe is Timothy Dwight, who is a, a, a New England writer and, 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 and kind of um, amateur historian writing in the 1790s uh, as he's traveling and visiting these sites in um, the Champlain Valley that are associated with Fort William Henry. He, he, he describes it as a massacre. Uh, another uh, report uh, of what happened there is by a, a fellow named Jonathan Carver. And if you're familiar with 18th century British North America, Jonathan Carver was kind of an explorer uh, who uh, after the French and Indian War went, uh, traveled through the upper Great Lakes, uh, through the Western Great Lakes and wrote a travel narrative. Um, and in, in his account of, uh, of, of traveling in that region, uh, he gave an eyewitness account of what had happened at uh, Fort William Henry and described it in these terms. A lot of the same uh, tropes uh, come up again and again in these early descriptions. Uh, a favorite one was Indian warriors, you know, grabbing the babies out of the arms of colonial women and dashing their brains out against trees and so forth. And if you read enough of these, you can see them, you know, these kind of images being recycled uh, ultimately until uh, James Fenimore Cooper uh, collects these stories and turns them into the narrative that becomes Blast of the Mohicans. Sure, great. Uh, Tim, I know you're familiar with uh, Fred Anderson's uh, uh, work uh, on the French and Indian War, the yeah. Seven Years' War, the Crucible of War, um, came out in 2000. Hard to believe it's uh, 21 years old, yes. getting ready to be 22 years ago that it came out. Um, but I want to read something to you that that Fred Anderson wrote in here and get your get your opinion on this because he it's 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 quite striking. I think you'll have an opinion. And he's talking about coming to grips with the French and Indian War in American history. And he writes that um, coming to grips with the Seven Years' War as an event that decisively shaped American history as well as the histories of Europe and the Atlantic world in general may therefore help us to begin to understand the colonial period as something more than a quaint mezzotint prelude to our national history. For indeed, if viewed not from the perspective of Boston or Philadelphia, but from Montreal or Vincennes, St. Augustine or Havana, Paris or Madrid, or for that matter, Calcutta or Berlin, the center of a American independence. What, what, what's your impression of, of, of Fred's conclusion? I, I think what he's trying to get his uh, readers to appreciate is that um, the, French, uh, the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, well, first of all, the French and Indian War and the Seven Years' War are two different things. You know, the French and Indian War is the North American theater of a global conflict uh, that engulfed the world uh, you know, between 1756 and 1763. And so one of the things he wants his readers to appreciate is that this is a, a global conflict in which North America is really just, just, just one theater. Uh, and that uh, if you're inclined to, to look at the world globally, to look at history globally, it, it has many ramifications in places we don't typically associate it with, like India, like the Philippines, like West Africa. Um, then the other thing I think he wants you to appreciate is that uh, the, the war in America uh, is often presented simply as a, a preface or a prelude to the American Revolution. And certainly, you know, it's kind of act one of the American Revolution. And, and I don't think he wants you uh, to think of it in those terms, right? Uh, that it's, it's not simply kind of a dress rehearsal uh, for um, the American Revolution. Rather, you know, it's, um, it, it, it's a conflict unlike any other up to that point in American history. Uh, there have been previous imperial wars, but for the most part, they were fought by colonial militiamen and some military adventurers and Native Americans. But this is the first war in North America that brings large numbers of British regular troops, French regular troops and their officers to North America. It brings you know, large naval forces, amphibious forces to North America. 
And it's on a scale that is just gonna dramatically transform the face of colonial America. Just the, the military engineering alone, the construction of Braddock's Road, the construction of Forbes's Road is going to open up the frontier. It's gonna cause all sorts of conflict with native peoples uh, along the Trans-Appalachian frontier. Uh, and so I think he wants you to appreciate the scale of the war on its own terms. Hi, why don't I go ahead and get started with a couple of questions from our Let's... folks in the Q&A. Sure. And... Right, can you... Yep. So um, we have a question here. Was the Indian way of war characteristic of all Eastern Indian people and is there any evidence that it existed in pre-colonial times, perhaps even back to the Mississippians? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, well, what I've described is the Native American way of war here, particularly the, the morning war complex. We typically associate with uh, Native peoples of Eastern woodlands. You know, that's a, that's a term that anthropologists use to describe kind of cultural similarities among Native peoples roughly in um, you know, the, the northeastern quadrant of, uh, of, of North America um, and, and, and into the South as well. Uh, certainly, we, we know that um, uh, practices like scalping occurred before contact with Europeans because we have the archaeological evidence uh, that shows that. Um, we know that uh, Native peoples warred with each other. Uh, because we see um, fortifications, you know, the archaeological record shows fortification of native villages. Uh, one thing I will note is um, some of the earliest visual representations we have of Native American warfare from, from people like uh, Champlain in the very early 17th century show Native American uh, warriors going off into battle almost in what we would call formation, you know, grouping very closely together, wearing armor, that is made out of woven mats uh, and similar natural materials uh, in, in a way that um, suggests uh, a highly ritualized kind of warfare uh, uh, and, 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 and tactics that um, reflected the use of, of bows and arrows, you know, as, as opposed to firearms. Obviously, when firearms show up, uh, um, armor that's made out of woven mats and similar natural materials are not going to be effective. And so, uh, that disappears very quickly. And the use of large scale formations is going to uh, uh, disappear as, as well. So, um, you know, if you look at the archaeological record, the very early visual record, um, uh, there is evidence that the Native American way of warfare certainly um, uh, predated uh, contact with Europeans. Uh, and, and, you know, you, the, the, you know, the person who posed the question mentions the Mississippian cultures, you know, going all the way back, you know, to 1000 AD or so. Um, we know that they uh, were practicing some method of captivity and slavery on a large scale because they were building these earthen mounds. Uh, and we have evidence in the archaeological record of people who appear to have been slaves, uh, you know, mass human sacrifice being interred uh, in, in, in some of those mounds. So I hope that answers the question. Um, I think that was... Um, fascinating and you know it's kind of bridges to so this next question that we have and that is out of the four significant colonial powers in North America which one was the most successful in using natives as allies in wars and they're wondering yeah. he has a guess but he's wondering if it can be quantified uh, 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 I would imagine I, I would have to say the French uh, were the most successful in, uh, in, in the use of Indian allies in warfare. Um, you know, uh, you know the, the four major powers, uh, I would say, are the French, the British, the Spanish, and the Dutch. And, uh, you know, the, the Dutch, uh, because it's a relatively uh, brief period in which, you know, they are uh, in, in New Netherland, um, uh, you know, are oftentimes at loggerheads with the Indians who live in the Hudson Valley, so not particularly effective. Um, you know, the Spanish do have a mission community uh, in, in Florida, and of course, if we go into New Mexico, they, they, they develop a, a mission society there. Um, uh, but when it comes certainly to fighting other European powers, like the French and the British, I don't think the Spanish are making particularly effective use of Indian allies. That leaves the French and the British, 
Um, and you know, the comparison of those is, is pretty straightforward. The French have a much smaller colonial population, uh, so they do not put the land pressure on native peoples that the British colonies do because the British colonies are expanding so quickly in terms of their, their demographics, the population's growing, putting land pressure on natives, dispossessing natives. Um, the French you know, also developed through the fur trade and through their missionary work, they developed very close alliances with native communities. And again, it's not, it's not compulsory. You know, there are no French priest or government official or military officers able to compel natives to fight, but there is a certain synergy, if you will, uh, that develops among these native communities in the St. Lawrence Valley that ring Montreal and Quebec and you know, in, in the French centers of trade and, and government there that make them very simpatico uh, and, uh, and allow the French to recruit native allies uh, with a degree of success that I think the, the British envy, uh, the British are never quite able to match. And I think that um, Gary had I think anticipated that answer because his question was what role, if any, did the fighting between early settlers, and I think we mean um, British settlers and the Native Americans in the early 1700s play in these wars? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, certainly, uh, if we're talking about British settlers, right, uh, we, we know that there's uh, a great deal of conflict in New England uh, during the era of King Philip's War in the 1760s. Um, that really um, uh, leads to uh, uh, you know, a, a breakdown, if you will, in, in peaceful relations between natives and uh, in, in the British colonists, colonists in, in New England. Uh, in Virginia, you know, um, uh, the Virginian colonists uh, war with the native uh, Powhatan Confederacy almost immediately, you know, starting with Jamestown and by the mid 17th century, uh, they've broken, uh, the, the, the military power of those Indians in the Southeast in South Carolina and Georgia in the late 17th century, there's an Indian slave trade that, you know, we don't know uh, that, that certainly when I was in high school and college, I was not learning about the Indian slave trade in colonial, you know, in the colonial Southeast, but it was there. And a lot of historians have, have kind of uncovered that in the last 20 years. And so, as you can imagine, um, you know, there's, there's dispossession, there's population dispersal. Uh, there's just a lot of ill feelings among the coastal native peoples that encounter British colonists in the 17th century and, and, those, and, and the descendants of those colonists. Um, by the time we get to the 1750s, the mid 18th century, the major native powers that have emerged in British North America are these confederacies like the, the Iroquois Confederacy in New York, the Cherokee along the Appalachian frontier of Virginia and North Carolina and modern day Tennessee, and then the Creek Confederacy uh, along Georgia and uh, in the modern state of, of Florida. Um, these are, are, are kind of groups that have come together and managed to exploit their pivotal position in the fur trade between the French and the Spanish and, and, and the British. And, um, you know, and, 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 and those groups at different times do see compelling reasons to side with the British versus the French. Uh, typically, uh, when it came to matters of trade, the British were better at supplying the fur trade. They could supply more goods on a more regular basis uh, at a cheaper rate. And so that motive, uh, you know, preserving and extending the fur trade becomes the greatest advantage, I think, that the British have in cultivating uh, Native American alliance. And uh, we've got, I think, time for two more questions. And this one is, why do you think, or why were the Indians and the colonial settlers so different in their war and fighting styles? Well, I think it does show you kind of the, the, the cultural differences, right, uh, between these societies. Uh, the big difference is this. Um, well, I, I say there are two big differences. One is Native Americans were a, a kinship society. You know, they, 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 uh, their, their politics, their government was, was based on lineage, based on, on clanship, right? Uh, who, how, how you connected in terms of familial connections, kinship connections to other people in your community. And so uh, going to war was a matter of following uh, somebody who uh, was influential to you, a chief, uh, an uncle, an elder of some sort, uh, oftentimes to uh, seek captives for your lineage, 
you know, to, to replace somebody who had died, uh, or perhaps to distinguish yourself and to kind of rise in, in the estimation of, uh, of your kin. And so warfare was something that was voluntary, like I said, non-compulsory. Europe uh, at this time in the, in, in the colonies they established were um, what we would call bureaucratic societies, right? And so they relied extensively on, um, on, on the ability to make people do things uh, through power of law. You know, the, 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 the use of military discipline in 18th century armies was quite severe. You know, the use of flogging of soldiers to keep them in line, shooting of deserters and, and that sort of thing. So that reflects that big cultural difference. The other big one I would emphasize uh, is technology. You know, the technology of warfare is very, very different uh, because of the European use of firearms. And then, of course, in the Seven Years' War, we see the importation of artillery into North America, you know, the construction of these forts out in the wilderness, dragging these cannon and other, you know, um, ar artillery across mountains, cutting down, you know, creating roads in order to transport this artillery. That's um, the ability to, to make war on a scale that uh, Native Americans simply cannot match. So our last question is a fun question, and that is, which version of the movie do you like the best and would you recommend? Uh, sure. Um, before I, I answer that, I will just note that um, uh, that slide that had uh, recommendations for further readings, if any of this has is, is interested you, I would just recommend that you follow up uh, with, with, with any of those items. Um, uh, Ian Steele in particular, uh, if you're interested in Fort William Henry, his book on Fort William Henry is, is, is excellent. Um, and then, so, so the films, I have seen the 1936 version, I think it is. Uh, and I have seen, of course, the Daniel Day-Lewis version, and I think it's 1991 or 92. I have to say, you know, um, I, I really do like the Daniel Day-Lewis version. Um, and I, I, I think I like it so much because it is just a, um, a, 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 a great adventure movie. You know, uh, there aren't too many films made about the colonial era in, the, in, in what became the United States. There are very, very few. Uh, so when I'm showing films to my students, it's hard to find something. You know, it's hard to find one about the American Revolution, for example, that I think is worthwhile. But I do think Last and Mohicans does a good job of adapting what today is a pretty boring novel. <laughs> you know, I, I don't recommend reading the novel to anyone. I find you know, reading uh, James Fenimore Cooper to be a bit of a slog, but it's a really good film adaptation of the novel that will hold your interest. And I do think that the scenes of the, the siege at Fort William Henry, the surrender, the negotiations, and then the, the massacre are very well done uh, and do an excellent job of conveying visually uh, what we know from the primary sources on paper. Um, the 1936 version is, uh, is, is good in its own right. In fact, the 1992 version really just, just remakes it with, with modern production values. Uh, but I, I do enjoy it. The other, while I, since this question came up, the other film I'll recommend uh, related to this topic that's probably less well known is a film called Black Robe, uh, which came at the same time as the 1990s Last of the Mohicans. It's by the uh, Australian director Bruce Beresford, and it's set in 17th century French Canada. It tells the story of a French Jesuit missionary uh, traveling the St. Lawrence River into the land of the Hurons to, to uh, be a missionary there. And along the way, he gets taken captive by Mohawk Indians. Uh, and in many ways, it's a, it's, it's a brutal, it's a very stark film, but I, I show it to my students as a way of really illustrating this class, clash of cultures going on between the French uh, and, the, uh, and the Native Americans of that region. I have to Agree with you, Timothy. I saw Last of the Mohicans in the theater when it came out, and it is one of the most visually stunning films yeah. you'll probably ever see. It's just really, really beautiful. And it afterwards, is. I checked uh, Last of the Mohicans out of the library, and I think I made it through maybe the first six or seven pages and yeah. just yeah. just gave up. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. maybe I now feel inspired to, to give it another shot. <laughs> well, I don't know. I Like I said, I've... Uh... I've, I call it the dental office of uh, American literature, the dental office visit of American literature. You, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're glad that you went, but, but, but while it's happening, you're not enjoying it at all. You know? Yeah. No.
Well, we have very much enjoyed having you with us this evening, and I know that our audience has as well. Um, this has been just a really fascinating discussion about a little known topic. And I think that's one of the wonderful aspects of being able to do history over Zoom is that you get to listen to interesting people tell you interesting stories. So we've just been delighted to host you and everyone else this evening. We look forward to uh, the programs coming up this week. We wanna thank everyone who's joined us or John with his technology failures, but you'll be seeing him all tomorrow at the next talk. Right. Thank you. Thank everyone. you everyone uh, for listening yeah. and, and being here.